All right, if you have your Bibles then, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Revelation 19, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head, on, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And, the, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness. God, we thank you uh, for your mercy and grace that was given to us in salvation. Lord, we pray for each and every one that is here tonight, Lord, that you would be with them. Uh, we know, when, we know no one is here by accident, but rather divine appointment. And we pray that we would be blessed in a great and wonderful way tonight. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, I think sometimes the, the issue of Revelation is we, we want to spiritualize it. And, uh, but a great deal of the book is real. I mean, that's what you have to get down to. But we're not going to really look at the prophecy of this book tonight. We're going to look at the who of this book. Mm -hmm. And the who of this book is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this is when his reign will be, and he will no longer be the humble servant, but the reigning king. And uh, the world has never seen him that way, and the world never will see him this way until this point. Now, prior to this, if you know your Bible, at one point, he, uh, the Bible says that there would be a group that would cry out for the rocks and the hills to fall on them rather than, say, that rather than face an eye-to-eye -eye encounter with the Almighty God. Right. Now, that's the natural man. We do not want to face God. Now, those that are in love with him, they look forward to the day, but that's just after you're mature. I've been preaching on this recently here, and think about the life of Moses. He started out as a religious sinner, and he showed his true colors when he killed somebody, and then he ran from God to the backside of the desert, and there he met the Almighty, and what was the reaction when he met the Almighty? He hid himself from him. But by the end of his life, he said, if I could just see it, yeah. if I could just touch it, that's maturity. And, and he said, well, Moses, nobody can see me and live. And you know what? Moses didn't care anymore. He, he was good with that. Right. But I want you to see the natural person has no interest in God whatsoever. Now, uh, they may be fearful of hell, but that doesn't mean they're desirous of God. Uh, the two are very, very different. And uh, in the modern day, we've almost been compelled to believe that they're the same, that they're not. Uh, man is a God-hater by nature. And so we find as the, uh, this uh, event begins to uh, transpire, John writes, And I saw heaven opened, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now, I want you to see sometimes we forget how close God is. 
We forget how close Christ is, but he just a glimpse away. Heaven opened, and they beheld the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in your most desperate moment, what you need is to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Now, are you going to see him bodily? No. But you can see his presence. Uh, you can understand his presence and know that he's there. And so we find that this individual is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is uh, hes coming, he, he's about to come down and deal with the sin in this earth. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Now, what a wonderful, glorious proof that that is the name, the names of the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and true. Amen. You know what? People will let you down, but Christ will never let you down. Right. He is faithful. Yep. He, he is always near you. Yep. Now, the other wonderful attribute about Christ that's named here is truth or truth, yep. faithful and true. Now, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell the truth, is it not? Uh, Donna comes out in the new dress and says, Larry, what do you think? What are you going to say? Right? Uh, oh, man, I wouldn't wear that to a dog fight. No. But see, uh, God's not like that, is he? The Lord God is not like that. If something's wrong, he'll flat tell you. That, that's the nature of our God. He's faithful and true. Uh, he'll tell you the good and he'll tell you the bad. He'll tell you when it's real, and he'll tell you when you're a fake. Yep. And that, that, that is a very different uh, type of love in the modern day where everything is good and nothing's wrong. It's hard to understand that love, but that's the very best love you can have is someone just being honest. You know, uh, when I worked hospice as a nurse, you would be amazed at I was the first one to tell those people, you're not going to make it. And you know why? Nobody had been truthful with them. Nobody had been true. Is that pleasant news to deliver? No, but it's true. You're dying and going to hell without the intervention of Christ. Not pleasant news, but it's true. It's true. And so we find that as, as he's being revealed to John on the Isle of Patmos, he finds two wonderful attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is faithful and true. We can depend on what this word says. Amen. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> two attributes that Christ did not reveal in his earthly ministry, uh, and that's his ability to judge. He had it. He just didn't use it. Mm -hmm. He remember the remember the woman that was taken in the uh, in adultery in the very act. I always wondered about the man, didn't you? Where'd he go? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, but he said, neither I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Yes. But see, the second time around, it's going to be totally different. Uh, he'll come and judge, and he'll say, you are unworthy. Uh, you're sinful. You don't know me. And that's a hard day that's coming. That, that's a very difficult time, but it's the reality that you have to live with. Right. See, we don't need, we're past the days. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon, and we're past the day of just walking around the issue. You know what we need? We need Christ. Amen. If you've not been born again, and listen, that ain't accepting a given set of facts that Jesus is king. That's not going to help you. Nope. Do you know Christ? That's, right. that, that's the only thing. I love being a good Baptist. But you know what? Being a five-pointer ain't going to send you into glory either. Uh, we need Christ. Amen. And, and so we see that when he comes back, he's going to reveal himself in a new way to this sin-cursed world, and that, and, and that being as a judge. And what you see, he's going to make war. This man of peace has turned, and now he's going to make war against what? Against sin. Amen. Against the very nature of sin, uh, against the very the, the very being that began rebellion, Satan himself, he's going 
going to make war. And you know what? Glory be to God. He's going to be a very, very victorious winner when the war happens. Amen. Uh, and so he comes with that mindset coming to the earth. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now that, I, at least I don't believe, I don't believe that means he was looking around and burning people when he was looking at them. But it was seen in the dark recesses right here. Yeah. When, you know what, when the flashlight is all you have, it's a lot, it's, it's pretty bright, isn't it? Dark, dark night, a flashlight would do a whole thing. God can look in the deepest abyss, the most religious individual that is, look in that darkness of religion and know if you've been born again. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that, that's what this is about. He, he can look and his judgment is always right. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's in uh, <coughs> Revelation, maybe chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, Matthew chapter 7. He said, there would be some that said, did we not prophesy or preach in your name? And he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew. See, an all-knowing God knows in different ways. Does he not? He knows your existence, but he don't know you intimately. And that, that, that's a huge difference. And when he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. I don't even know you spiritually. You're not mine. You do not belong to me. And that's what he's seeing with his, with his fiery eyes is the spiritual condition of mankind, the, the individual in his uh, position before Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Now, uh, a lot of, I've, seen, I've heard a lot of different ideas on the crowns. I personally believe they will be crowns gifted him or are required by the believer. If I understand the New Testament right, there are four crowns an individual can have in this life to lay at the feet of Jesus. We find the tw 20 and four elders in Revelation uh, chapter four casting crowns before him. And uh, so we find, but the, the real meaning of crown, and you can go into a great deal and wonder about that. And at the end of the day, you're still wondering. But I do know this, a crown represents position. It, rec it, it recognizes who you are. The, uh, the Queen Elizabeth, no one else wears the crown but her. And in the very same way, no one is going to wear these crowns because no one is, is worthy of them but Christ himself. No one has the authority but Christ himself. And, and, and so he will, he will be coming in this way, showing his authority, showing his ability to judge, and showing how, uh, how powerful he is, and that he is the one in command. <coughs> then it says in the uh, last of that verse, uh, and he had a name written and no, that no man knew but he himself. Now, all the Bible scholars of the day, they seem so caught up with their self, and uh, uh, I, I'm certainly a country pe preacher and don't understand a lot of that, but, you know, Yahweh being the, uh, the, the uh, speechless name of God, and then I understand there's another one, and Yahweh is just kind of a turn on that, but spelled with all consonants, and that way there, it's the unspeakable name of God. But I want you to see, it's not necessarily what the word is, this is, this is the reality. It is that we don't understand who he is. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of people that may in here uh, uh, may understand it, may not. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of um, phlebotomy. Everybody know what that is? Some of you, right? Some of you know better than others. It's just the study of blood or uh, accessing blood, really. And I know that because I studied it. Have you ever thought that you only know as much about God as he's revealed to you? Oh. That's very humbling, isn't it? Right. So this name that no one can say and no one knows 
It's the stuff we don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't believe we're going to have a five-point celebration when we get to glory to you. <laughs> I'm going to, I believe we'll understand the speakless name, the speakless things of God. And so when he comes again, as always, he only reveals of himself what he wishes to his creation. And so this is the name that no one knew but he himself. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's the mighty sacrifice. That's his own blood for you and I. And his name is called, and this is where we can specifically identify whom John is uh, speaking of, and his name, the Word of God. Now, in, in, the, in the Gospel of John, the first 12 verses is dedicated to explaining, in the beginning was the Word, right. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. So we find the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things combined together, coming back to issue judgment. That's very humbling, isn't it? Very, very humbling. You know, the only, the only thing that you have to claim is grace. Amen. The only thing you have to claim is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and sometimes I think we forget that, and we, we do this and we do that, and, and, and on and on we could do, go with that. But I want you to see, at the end of all that, your only claim is the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that is our only claim yeah. Yeah. to be in glory. Yeah. And verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him. Now, again, it's one of those things that can be a lot of debate on that. But see, people that are loyal to you, they'll follow you. So whomever these uh, individuals are, if they're the redeemed going on to glory, or if they're angelic beings, or they're people that died in the faith, or whatever this group is, they're his because they're obedient. You don't count yourself much of a believer if you're not obedient to that word. Amen. That's right. That's not pleasant thoughts, but it's true. Yeah. Remember, he, his name... Is truth. His name is true. So if we're not obedient, then I don't see how you can claim that, do you? You know, you know whose kids I whip? Mine. I don't even whip my grandchildren, mainly because they never deserve it. But uh, they're not mine. You see what I'm saying? And if you never got a good working over. You may not have what you think you do. Amen. And, and so we see the Lord here is revealing himself in a brand new way. The Lord Jesus Christ now coming as judge. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Now a vesture is what we often think of, or at least the the bodice, or uh, what we think of as a vest. Uh, it, it is this portion of the torso. This is where this thing will be located. And it's an identifier. Now, I've never, I've never been in the Army, don't know very little about the Army, but I know in the pictures I've seen of Dad, every one of his uniform had Lafferty right here. And there's a lot to involve with that. It don't, not only identified him for him what, who he was, but if he had been cut, killed in the jungles of Vietnam, <clears throat> it would have been his identifier. When they dug him up, I thought, this is Lafferty. We can get him back to Tennessee. It's an identifier. And so this, this vesture that he has on is going to reveal who he is. It's going to reveal the person of Christ. It's going to reveal... Uh, his role in this return to this present world, it is going to show whom he is. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Again, showing exactly who he is. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Again, obedience, doing what he would bid us to do. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Now anytime you find the word white 
In the Bible, it represents purity. And the only purity you have is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So whoever these individuals are, uh, if they're, they're saved and redeemed, returning with the Lord, or if they are, uh, if they're pure angels or whatever they are, I personally believe it's the, the, the redeemed that they're saved. They're pure. There's no pureness in man whatsoever. Amen. Don't ever, don't ever fool yourself into believing that. That's why the stupidity of a decisional regeneration is so stupid because you don't have enough spiritual sense to make the right decision. That's right. We're wicked. And so we find we find in in this individual that his army is pure. It's white, it's clean. It's redeemed. What uh what army are you on? Hmm. You ever thought about that? Good question. I like the thought of the Lord's people as an army because you know what? I know uh, Brother Junior didn't volunteer. He was drafted. <laughs> yeah. You know when you're drafted you don't have a choice. You ever think about that? I didn't make a choice. I was drafted. God designed it before the world began and I was drafted to this position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we find here that his army, clean and white, is coming with them. They're his. They belong to him. They're pure and white. They're redeemed individuals coming on behalf and with the Lord Jesus Christ to make this event occur. Now notice uh, in verse 15. And out of his mouth, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Now we, we, we see the Lord described as faithful and true. Now we see this thing that goes out, and it always has been, that the word of God is sharp. Uh, and and his, uh, I think in his own ministry it's described as a two-edged sword. Maybe it's in one of Paul's church letters. But either way, a two-edged sword cuts going this way, and it cuts coming back. That's the word of God. Mm -hmm. You know, we love Psalms 23. Uh, I've only been to the funerals I preached where Psalms 23 wasn't read somewhere along the way. Uh, it's a comforting verse. Nothing wrong with that. But see, the meaty part of the word of God is the part that says that we can do nothing in and of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. No man can cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. That's some difficult verses, is it not? Yeah. It kind of leaves you out of it, does it not? It means there's nothing you can do. There's no hope. Unless Christ intervenes, you'll stay well where you're at. And, and so we find here that as the Lord... Uh, reveals this thing, he, he again reminds them that the Word of God isn't always pleasant. It, 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 does, it, isn't a, it is a, not a warm hug. You know, uh, I, I look at some of these churches today, and I was telling Adam, and I won't say the, the group, but I said, that thing's as big as a woes. I mean, just unbelievable building. But I love it. What are they preaching in there? Are, are, they, are they really preaching that man's defiled and grace is the only way? It's hard for me to buy that. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ, the very deity Son of God, preached for three and a half years and came up with 11, huh. it's sure hard for me to believe that they're on point, don't it, you? Uh, it's not pleasant to hear that there are going to be individuals that said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Mm -hmm. It's not pleasant to hear you be cast in the lake of fire which burneth forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. That's not pleasant, is it? No. Mm -hmm. But it is the word of God, is it not? Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. The good and the bad. <laughs> And so we find as the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene, 
He very much displays himself for whom he is and what he is able to do. And his word once again cuts the nations. The rest of verse 15, that with it, he should smite the nations. Now, this is an aside, but I'll just give you an explain how messed we're up we are in the world we live, the nation that we abide in. I try not to fuss about it because God divinely placed me here. And so I, I, can't, I can't really fuss much. But I noticed today when I was going around doing my visits, everything was at half mass. And I said, well, did somebody important die that I didn't know about? I thought maybe Jimmy Carter finally died. But uh, uh, it wasn't Jimmy. Uh, it, and, and not that it's bad, but those shooting victims. Yeah. I'm like, as tragic as that is, that's not any national value. Right. Those men didn't die more. Those individuals didn't sacrifice their life for the good of our nation. Is it tragic? Sure. And you know, our dear president, he said he did that to bring awareness of gun control. God help us. Amen. And, and so we find on this, in this time of judgment, that governments that are so, so erroneous, and, and that's just a drop in the bucket, they're going to be judged. That's right. And he, meaning Christ, shall rule them with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been hoodwinked in believing that the United States is the ideal kingdom. First of all, because of the United States government, and I'm not fussing, it's the best we got. We don't even know what a king or queen is because we're going to get rid of them in four years, right? Right. But the ideal government is a theocracy ruled entirely by God. Amen. And that, that was the original plan God set up for Israel. They rebel, rebellious. They wanted a king, and they got a king. And he was an abject rebel. Rebel. Saul was ungodly from the word go. Yep. But I want you to see, having not a good understanding of kingship, we don't know what ruling with an iron is about. That means if he says it, it happens, and it don't only happen, it happens quickly. You don't sit and meditate, well, would this be best for me? No, you move on it. And all these rebellious nations that always shook their face in God and deny his deity, as soon as he speaks it, they're obligated right. to do it. That's right. Amen. You ever thought about the joy when it says, every knee shall bow Amen. and every tongue shall confess Amen. that he is God? Amen. Can you imagine the victorious day when Madam Marilyn O'Hare will bow at the feet of Jesus and say, you are God. <laughs> Some of the most ungodly, Adolf Hitler, he's going to do it too. He was a Jew hater. You don't hate God's people and get by with it. Don't bow and say, thou, thou art worthy. See, uh, sometimes we need a little bit of reminding that as we stroll along the way here because it does get discouraging and you want to quit. But I want you to see that the day of his victory is coming. A very harsh rule. The rest of that verse says, And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, what is the purpose of of wine press. It's to create juice that will then be created into wine. <laughs> and uh, the, the hard part is about it, the grapes have to just be completely smushed. Nothing left. Every drop gone. So are you going to give your drop now? Or are you going to give it then? <clears throat> See, we, we want to give this much to Christ. Tithe on our money and tithe on our, on our time and go back home. Mm -hmm. Well, he's going to get more than that out of you. Mm -hmm. 
He'll literally crush the, the praise out of you in this time. If you won't praise him now, you'll praise him then. And, and so we find that in this judgment, and again, remember, these are not redeemed people he's dealing with. These are dealing with lost people. <laughs> and they too will praise him for who he is. Verse 16. And he had on his vesture, again, this part of his body, and on his vesture, the bodice, the vest, and on his thigh, coming down like this, so it would be kind of like a sash, I believe, tied here, and then going on down. And on his vesture and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, do you view Christ that way? That's a, a very hard question to answer, isn't it? Do you view Christ if he says that you immediately do it? That, that's a key. It's obligatory. You, you have to do it immediately. You don't have time to contemplate it. Remember, as he, I think he uh, was giving an example, I think he was speaking in parables, and he said that he called one and said, let me, let me go bury my father. Mm -hmm. And he says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Immediately. Can you imagine a wonderful time, even in your own life, where there's no hesitation? You know, there are natural things that come up. I have to go to work in the morning, except for the part of returning to the Lord. And I have to clock in and do another day's work. Now, I would much rather stay at home, but I've often thought, if I could stay at home, would I really give that time to the Lord? And to be honest, I'd have to say probably not. So maybe that's why he gives us the curse of man because he knows what we're going to do anyway. But doing what he says when he says it, that is a king. That, that is a potentate. That is one that ruleth well. Now, if we say we are Christian and we say that we are part of his kingdom, then why don't we? Why, why isn't that our mode? Well, for the redeemed, it's because of sin in our life. For the lost, you have no choice. You're going to go after your master. But for the redeemed, it's a constant fight. One day to the next. But I want you to see here, he displays himself to a T. Now, very quickly, I want you to go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to read a couple of verses and be done. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse 45. Lord Jesus Christ speaking in parables. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 45, and again... The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seek, seeking goodly pearls. And when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now this is not buying your redemption. This is not buying your salvation. But it is recognizing the luster and beauty of Christ and giving up everything you have. Mm -hmm. That is the most difficult thing an individual will ever do. More than anything else, wanting the person of Christ. You know, I'll have to say in the, in the flesh, I honestly cannot imagine that. Can you really? Mendona bearing down on 54. Can you imagine... Larry, Donna, I want y'all to go to South America. 
sell, sell everything we've had that we've worked for for 30, 40 years and head south at our age. <laughs> but if you got that one pearl, you would do it. It would be hard. If you, in other words, if you put it in the right place, if he becomes the pearl of your life, you'll do it. And if he isn't, you never will. Then right. one more place, and we'll get out of this hot bed. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, we read of another individual that uh, looks, at th looks at things from a very worldly aspect. Gospel of Luke, chapter 12 beginning in verse 16. The Bible says, And he, meaning Christ, spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Yeah. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room wherein to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Nothing wrong with that until now. And I will say to my soul, So, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, I want you to see he went from financial success. And I've heard a lot of preachers, and I don't necessarily believe this true. It's true. There wouldn't have been no, nothing wrong with it. But they said, well, he should have took what he could have and give the rest to the poor. Well, that's noble, but I don't think that's true. His huge error was this. He went from financial to success and dealing with that godly increase and said, so... See, present things have nothing to do with spirituality. That's right. If you live in a rusty single wide or an eight bedroom mansion, that has nothing to do with spiritual things. Right. So his era was this. It was when he went from financial success to going so. He imputed success to the inner man. There was nothing to do with the inner man. He said, so, well, all that wonderful stuff he had had nothing to do with his spiritual condition. That's why later uh, <laughs> the Lord said, it is hard, it, uh, hardly a rich man will go into, into heaven. And so we find the same thing here. Now, it never says, which, you know, if this man went to heaven or hell, but it does say this, thou fool. That's right. It's very foolish mm -hmm. not to think about eternal things. Amen. Think about them now. Mm -hmm. Think about them on this side of glory. Mm -hmm. Evaluate yourself. Make your calling and election sure. Amen. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who shall those things be? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Have you youngins fighting over it? Sure. That's why me and Donald still live in the devil wide. None of them's going to want it anyway, so they don't have to fight about it. Right? But where are you at tonight? Are you a fake? Or are you like Moses at the end, just desiring to see him? Even if it takes you out, you want to see him anyway. That's where I'd like to abide.